Something similar happened to the wild memes of religion. They got themselves domesticated. They acquired stewards who were prepared to devote their lives to their flourishing. But, you know, there's a quid pro quo. Many features of that dairy cow are not so much for the benefit of the cow as for the benefit of the dairy herder. That's the price of domestication. So that when we look at religious memes, at the memes of organized religion, the domesticated memes, we should be on the lookout for rather different selection pressures to have been operating than in the wild days. I got you as far as a bunch of God memes or supernatural entity memes uh, uh, in the wild religion, but now we have to start thinking about the uses of domesticated God memes. One of them that, uh, again, this is speculation, but it's, uh, 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 it's guided by facts and it's uh, subject to confirmation. We can, design, we can design inquiries and investigations and experiments which can shed light on whether it's true or not. One idea which I've loved for years comes from Julian Jaynes' remarkable, eccentric, but brilliant book, uh, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. He suggests, that book has about a hundred really good ideas and about a thousand bad ones, but <laughs> this is one I think of the good ones. He suggests that when civilizations began to, when cities began to get large, when people began to live in larger groups, decision making became really onerous and difficult. People just didn't know how to make up their minds. And it was harder than it had ever been before. And so they ended up sort of in desperation looking for what he called exopsychic means of decision making. Like flipping a coin, like consulting tea leaves, like throwing the I Ching, like sacrificing animals and looking at their entrails burning virgins and seeing which way the smoke blows, you know. <laughs> in fact, there are hundreds of different techniques that, e that evolved back in those days for, for flipping a coin. A particularly useful one was basically to, to consult the gods, because that was useful for many reasons. First of all, it got you off the hook. If the decision you made was wrong, well, don't blame me, you know. I, <laughs> I'm just the messenger. I got the, I got the idea from the <coughs> God, who can never, of course, contradict you. <laughs> nice thing about the idea is that a practice like that can spread without anybody understanding the rationale for it. They don't have to understand the rationale. Any more than the sheep have to understand the rationale for domesticating themselves. It's a good idea, but they don't have to recognize it. Same thing is true of these. Uh, one of my favorite hypotheses uh, for further exploration is McLennan's hypothesis that shamanic healing rituals, which were very widespread and culturally transmitted, led to the convergent evolution, convergent social evolution. Again and again and again, the shamanic healers discovered, reinvented, and refined basically techniques of hypnotic induction. That what the rituals of shamanic healing are, are hypnotic induction rituals. And hypnosis has genuine medical benefits. There's many things, particularly for analgesia and for the relief of many psychosomatic or, or partly psychological conditions. Won't do you much good for a broken leg. But hypnosis has some genuine medical uh, applications where it works well. And back in those days, before there was any other kind of medicine, if you were not susceptible to hypnosis, you didn't have any health insurance. <laughs> there could be quite a strong selection pressure based on susceptibility to hypnosis. And that could then create a bounce in the genes so that you have a cultural genetic coevolution for susceptibility to hypnotic induction. Now we know, we've confirmed really, a similar story already with regard to lactose tolerance in adulthood. Those of us, there are probably a few people here who are not lactose tolerant in, as adults. Are there any lactose intolerant people here? Yes, you're normal for a mammal. Mammals in general are not capable of, of digesting milk after they're weaned. We're the only mammals really that can. It's abnormal for mammals but normal for human beings and it is a genetic change in most of us which can be traced back to those lineages of our ancestors who kept dairy herds and who drank the milk raw rather than 
fermenting it or turning it into something like cheese. That's pretty well established by Luca Cavalli Sforza and his colleagues. Then, of course, one that everybody knows is the surrogate police. I like to tell the story about the, the little town in Maine where I have my farm. And, and you approach it, and there's a sign on the edge of town that says, you know, uh, welcome to Brooksville. Your speed is uh, uh, radar controlled. Somebody says to the, to the chairman of the board of selectmen, he says, that must have been pretty expensive. He says, no, it costs about $5. <laughs> Just get a piece of plywood and some paint. You know? <laughs> These are among the uses of uh, domesticated God means. So the claim in the book is that organized religions descended from folk religions. When we became conscious, deliberate stewards, this changed everything. Now, one of, a technical term in my earlier work, which I, which I now harness for pretty heavy lifting in, in this book, is the idea of a free-floating rationale. This is the reason something happens where the agents in particular don't have to understand it. One of the most vivid and moving cases is actually the cuckoo chick. When cuckoos, you know, they're parasites. They, the cuckoos do not make their own nests. The mother cuckoo, the female, when she's ready to lay her eggs, she finds a host nest of another species and waits for the, for the female to lay the eggs in that nest, then when, when the parents are off getting more twigs or feeding or something, she darts down, lays her egg in the host nest, and then very often she'll push one of the other eggs out. That's just in case the hosts can count. <laughs> And then she flies away, never returns, never has anything more to do with, with her egg. The, the cuckoos tend to hatch quicker than other birds, not surprisingly. And the first thing that baby cuckoo does, it can't see, it's featherless, it's this scrawny little fledgling. When it gets out of the egg, the first thing it does is this. It, it wrestles around the other eggs and tries to push them out of the nest. And if you've ever seen the video of it, it's absolutely blood curdling to watch this, this um, egg aside happening. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you, all the side? I don't know. Yeah. Now, you know, the, that sweet little cuckoo chick, it doesn't understand what it's doing. It doesn't have to understand the rationale. The rationale is there. We all know why it's happening. We know what the reason is for this, but it's not a reason that the cuckoo has to understand or appreciate. It doesn't have to represent that reason. It just has to have enough control in it so that it accomplishes this task for whatever reason it doesn't have to know. That's what I call a free-floating rationale. And of course, in the case of Dicrocelium dendriticum, we had another nice example of that, because the Dicrocelium dendriticum, it doesn't understand what it's doing when it crawls into that ant's brain. It's I would say has an IQ approximately that of a carrot, you know. Uh, it doesn't need to think it out, it just has to be designed to be the beneficiary. In organized religion though, things start to change because now the question of who benefits falls under the tracking of an entirely different set of processes because now we get a shift from free-floating rationales to represented rationales. Represented where? In the minds of particular human beings, in the minds of the domesticators, in the minds of the priests and the rabbis and the imams and the religious leaders of all kinds. There they start tinkering. They become mimetic engineers and re-engineers. They become like the methodical breeders of animals and plants. And now a whole new set of selection pressures arises. The rationales of the stewards are responsive to other goals, goals that evolution by natural selection without human stewards are not responsive to. And that does change everything. I'm going to give you just a few examples of the adaptations of organized religion that you don't find in wild religions, in folk religions, and that play a big role uh, in, in, in the elegance of design of contemporary religion. And perhaps the most central and important is what I call belief and belief. Now, some people believe in God. Many people believe in God. 
Some people believe in belief in God. That's different. If you believe in belief in God, it's because you, you think belief in God is a really good thing. Gee, I wish everybody did. Uh, I wish more people did. Belief in God is a wonderful thing. That's what it is to believe in belief in God. Now, that's different, right, from believing in God. Now, interestingly enough, more people believe in belief in God than believe in God. <laughs> How do I know that? Well, think about it. With very few exceptions, if you believe in God, you also believe in belief in God. There may be a few people who deeply regret their belief in God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, gosh, I wish I didn't believe in God. I wish nobody did. You know? Can't get this darn belief out of me. There, there probably are a few. I'm sure there are a few.